Well, I hope I can make this uh, relevant to you this afternoon. Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be here. To uh, set the stage, um, I think you're pretty well all aware that your patients in the CCU are in increasingly uh, uh, ill. This is uh, a trend of five years in your CCU, taken from the Ontario Critical Care Information uh, System. And uh, this is looking at all your adult patients uh, with specifically mechanical uh, ventilation. And this is expressed as a day rate. So last year, you provided 6,000 uh, CCU days of care. And about uh, 1,300 of those days, patients were intubated. And that's expressed as a rate of about 22%. So that's certainly increasing from five years ago of, uh, of 15%, and obviously at you know, a great uh, human and financial cost. Uh, to put it in context, for all critical care beds in Ontario, last year the mechanical uh, ventilation day rate was 38%. So below average, but still uh, uh, you know, considerable expense. So uh, that, that's where we begin. Um, and that 1,300 days that I mentioned, mechanical ventilation, it's estimated that about half of those days are actually spent weaning. That is, from the time where you believe that the initial uh, problem is resolved and you're contemplating extubating the patient. So to put it into perspective, uh, down here in the corner, why do we ventilate patients? Well, with acute respiratory failure, there's a, an imbalance between the demands and, and your capacity. I won't get in too much into the physiology here, but they can either be pressure or ventilation load demands. And um, certainly, as we move from, treat this by supporting, and sometimes total, partial, until you get back to a place where we can extubate you. It's dynamic. Uh, this can change over the course of critical illness, so we can change the load by over-resuscitating, uh, leading to pulmonary edema and decreased compliance, certainly contribute to delirium, over-sedation, and very importantly, uh, uh, muscle weakness. So my little cartoon up here, there's kind of seven stages identified to weaning. Um, and I'll talk about most of them, hopefully, uh, within the 15 minutes. Um, it starts with a, a, a suspicion. Uh, it seems rather straightforward, but these patients are complex. And of course, uh, based on physician expertise, it might be actually overlooked. We'll talk about predictors, weaning trials, extubation and reintubation, and maybe some non-invasive ventilation if we have time. So in 2010, there was an expert consensus uh, panel that came up with uh, basic definitions as to weaning difficulty. So there's those patients who are, are weaned simply, and they're extubated after a first weaning test. Um, in fact, the vast majority of patients on ventilators are weaned easily, 60%. Uh, these were four trials, uh, observational trials that came out after this definition uh, in various types of ICUs. And so here I have patients in each group, reintubation rate and ICU mortality. So the vast majority are actually simply weaned, 60% uh, in this particular trial, maybe up to 75% in the real world. The barriers or issues here seems to be certainly screening, as I said, uh, over sedation is a big one. My clinical impressions here. And then we have the difficult to wean who fail the first time you try a weaning test and may take up to seven days. Again, over sedation is a prominent theme fluid overload, very much so, and infectious causes as well. Infectious causes certainly are a component of the prolonged weaning as well. These are patients who stay more than seven days after their first attempt to wean. And um, the issues here generally tend to be pump failure. And here I'm talking not only cardiac, but respiratory as well. Uh, and there's a huge overlap with chronic critical illness, of course, and of course, weakness is a major part of that. The other Two messages from this would be that certainly with regards to prolonged in, in, uh, intubation and ventilation, it's closely associated with very high mortality, and we see that here as well. The other thing I would say is that extubation failure occurs even in the simple group. It occurs in all groups, actually. 
So when we talk about extubation failure, we have this uh, concept that there's some must be some sweet spot. If you never extubate anyone and are very conservative, uh, you never have any failure. But surely there must be a price to pay. So here's some evidence for that. There's a lot in the literature about association between extubation failure. It's variably defined, uh, most commonly as less than 48 hours, and that's the definition I'll use here. So there's a lot of papers about association, but there's only really two quality papers that uh, attempt to show a, a causal link. And I've listed them here. This is a large uh, Spanish trial here. And for street creed, uh, I've put our own experience here over the last five years in the surgical ICU with patients who are ventilated more than 48 hours. And the numbers are remarkably similar. So this trial here, the rate of failure, and in the literature, again, for cross-observational and uh, interventional trials, uh, failure might be reported anywhere between 5% to 35%. Tends to be lower in surgical ICUs, but 15% is a pretty good name, uh, a pretty good place to hang your hat. So there's a 15% failure rate, and uh, mortality in the reintubated versus the non-intubated for this particular trial here, it was associated, or uh, an, after multi-logistic regression, there seemed to be a causal link with an odds ratio of about 3.3 uh, for those patients who needed reintubation. And our numbers are very similar here. So uh, again, 15% seems to be. <clears throat> so if you just don't extubate people, you won't fail. But is there a price to pay as well? There's a lot less evidence there, but most of the time when we talk about this, we point to this study here. So this is a, a single center trial from Seattle in isolated brain injured patients. Uh, patients who did not have an unexplained uh, reason for coma. And uh, a very highly selected group, they had 136 patients who were eventually extubated and didn't die before extubation. And they had a, a research team come around and do a standardized assessment of readiness to extubate every day. And uh, the uh, medical team, the physicians and the respiratory therapists were unaware of uh, what the research team was doing. And uh, basically there was 99 patients who ended up who were extubated the day that they were actually assessed to be ready versus 37 who experienced delay. And that delay was a median of three days. And you can see that uh, the pneumonia rates were higher in the extubation delay. I know Kathy Sue is going to speak about ventilator-associated pneumonia. Uh, certainly, obviously, the ICU length of stay was longer. But most importantly, the mortality was nearly double. And so there seems to be a price to pay um, for extubation. Uh, delay as well. So we want to hit that sweet spot and uh, that's talking about a population but for individual patients wouldn't it be nice to know. Uh, so there's great interest in, in weaning parameters. There's a lot written about this as well and you might hear us talk about it. Getting back to our cartoon here of demand versus capacity, uh, there's various aspects to that and these indices look at various aspects of that. So I've, I've put some again some numbers over here on which to hang your hat on. PF as a, uh, um, a shorthand for shunt, um, your negative inspiratory force, your vital capacity, etc. No solitary index is uh, really of any predictive value. Uh, lots has been written. Since there's various aspects of, of this, it's only natural that one would look to integrate that. And so composite indices do exist. Um, the one that's most widely used by far, and which is most published on, is, is, and you'll hear us speak about, is the rapid shallow breathing index. So patients who are failing uh, tend to breathe uh, quicker and more shallowly as they fatigue. Uh, some of these other things just aren't useful on a day-to-day -day basis or require specialized uh, equipment. What you'll hear my trainees talk about um, is, seems to be, this obviously is a continuous variable, but it's dichotomized into a cutoff point of 105 for a rapid shallow index with a, a strong positive predictive value and negative predictive value. That doesn't actually refer to a weaning trial and your chance of failing with extubation. What it was originally intended for was this was a screening trial to go on to the next step, which is the weaning trial. 
So uh, that's how it actually should be used. Now this only takes in the aspect of the respiratory demand versus load. The other aspect to being intubated is you need to protect your airway. So these things, none of this really takes into account that. Uh, you can try to quantify these things. Most things that we talk about are actually um, qualitative or semi-quantitative. So that's probably a main issue in why we have a hard time. So when you put all that together and you, you look at the evidence behind it and the evidence-based medicine with regards to weaning, um, what most people recommend is there must be some algorithm or protocol to follow in weaning. And uh, what's important about understanding this is that weaning protocols really uh, shorten your weaning time, but they don't change um, rate of failure. We have our own overall strategy here at the Heart Institute that you can find on our info web here. And most weaning strategies look something like this. So you're mechanically ventilated and then you have an inkling that uh, your issues are resolving, your PF ratio is good, uh, you're on minimal PEEP, you're somewhat awake. We're rather liberal in the surgical ICU with regards to uh, Rhinotropes, it doesn't dissuade us often. And then as I said, the proper way to do this is to do a rapid shallow breathing index that's measured at three minutes after you lower the support. If it's over a hundred, then the idea is that screening has failed and that you should resume where you were at on mechanical ventilation. Less than that, you should proceed to a breathing trial. And I'll speak more about that. Breathing trial then is, is a clinical trial. So again, uh, support is lowered and then we look for signs of distress. And again, people describe these variably or include different things in them. But in general, you can tell rather easily somebody's sweating, their blood pressure's gone up, their heart rate's gone up, they're tachypnic. <clears throat> if that is the case, then you go back to a, some mode of ventilation. Now I'd like to tell you more about that, but there really is no evidence as to what types of modes and you have to remember most of these are ventilator companies trying to sell their product. Uh, that's why they exist. But there's no real evidence as to what type of mode leads best to weaning. Whether there's, and, and, and within that, whether a gradual decrease in support or whether to continue to do uh, some kind of sprints with breathing trials is actually a preferred method, we don't know. If none of those things exist, then it's justifiable to, to go to the step of extubation. So central to that is uh, this idea of breathing trial. And no one wants performance issues, but um, how you do that actually does vary tremendously, even within this institution. So uh, some of the issues surrounding that is how long you do it for. So again, people go anywhere from 30 minutes to 120 minutes. There's no, again, no real evidence as to which is better. Likely 30 minutes is fine. You do run the risk of if you extend that of exhausting patients uh, actually before they're extubated. And then uh, how you lower that support is actually key. So this is a note from last week, a patient in the surgical ICU. Uh, the RT has written that they did a breathing trial on 100% TC, that's tube compensation. That's a low level of pressure support that is dialed in to uh, compensate for the resistance just from the endotracheal tube and five centimeters of PEEP. Rapid shallow breathing index after a half hour was between 50 to 60, and their uh, negative inspiratory force was minus 30 centimeters of water. They weren't able to obtain a vital capacity as the patient wasn't cooperating. Hmm. Gives me pause for thought here. The patient was extubated, remains extubated today. Here's a patient in your CCU from earlier this week. This was a man with heart failure and kidney failure and volume overload. And so uh, what we've done here is we put him on a T-piece. So oxygen coming in this limb here, he breathes. And uh, this is essentially the... Uh, so we all, uh, hopefully, operate at ZEEP. So there's a big difference in how you do these tests. So fully ventilated versus pressure support with, with uh, PEEP uh, versus pressure support without PEEP versus T. 
So there's great debate as to what is best and we don't really know. Likely, the idea is, is that with T-piece you get f fewer uh, false positives, uh, but again at the risk of it, uh, not recognizing that the patient can actually be extubated. This patient here became diaphoretic and sweaty within 20 minutes. Again, as pressure went up. It was no-brainer. We leave this to the uh, respiratory therapist to go. The inter-observer variability is quite low. It's rather easy to recognize. So return to ventilation, we'll try again today, tomorrow, etc. So why do people then fail after they've had a spontaneous breathing test? Well, I already hinted at that we simply don't capture everything that we're interested in. And I said the extubation failure rate, the false positive, is around 15%, and that seems to be the number in the literature. The false negative rate? Well, uh, the, here we're talking planned extubation. Patients who fail a breathing trial and then self-extubate, actually about 40, 60% of them actually don't require reintubation. So when we're looking for things that uh, might lead to you actually fail uh, extubation after a successful breathing trial, we look for the things we're not measuring. Certainly what's prominent is upper airway obstruction. In the literature, again, you, you find what you look for, and there's a huge observation bias in the literature. Uh, and it varies between 5 and 80%. In, in my experience, I would suggest that the true number of true failure due to upper airway extraction is, is around 5%. This is one of our patients who failed post-extubation here uh, with laryngeal edema and maybe even a, a web here. It seems to occur more often in women, and certainly there seems to be a factor of a, have a rather large endotracheal tube for their side. We try to look for that. We, we don't routinely do, but we probably should be uh, doing a cuff leak test on everyone. And that's where we simply let the cuff down, uh, give a positive pressure breath, listen with a stethoscope for a leak. Uh, corticosteroids, uh, again, there's not good evidence for supporting their use or not supporting their use. But people do this, it generally takes at least, thought to take at least 12 hours before it's effective. The risk-benefit ratio probably favors corticosteroids. It's something that I, I routinely do not do. <clears throat> and then why else do people fail? Certainly, again, there's not a lot of great evidence on this. But throughout the literature, these themes are there. And again, in keeping with, it's, these are what's hard to measure. So neuro neurocognitive or delirium issues, high secretory burden. So in general, what we're talking about here is if you're being suctioned less than once every two hours, that's usually a good sign. But again, it, it's very operator dependent. Some nurses are, are, are suctioning all the time. I can't be at the bedside all the time. I rely on them. And obviously fluid overload. So any one of these or a triad to me is giving alarm bells and I, I pause for thought even if they've had a successful uh, breathing trial. So the last thing, the fluid overload, is a nice segue into something that might be uh, of more interest to you. So uh, there is more and more literature all the time on weaning failure of cardiac origin. Certainly positive pressure ventilation is a cornerstone of therapy for pulmonary edema and is recognized as such. On the back end when we're extubating, though, I guess human nature is, is that we forget about that. And we're not just removing the airway here. What's important is that we're removing the positive pressure. So the pathophysiology, uh, you probably know as well as I do, you take away that uh, positive interthoracic pressure, and as a result, you increase venous return. And at the same time, you remove the positive benefit of positive pressure ventilation on the LV, and so you increase the LV preload. At the same time, your work of breathing goes up and your lung volumes decrease. And this leads to adrenergic stress and potentially myocardial ischemia, all of which would lead to pulmonary edema. Again, there's a myth of, you'll see this written in the chart, I read it in the chart, minimal ventilatory settings. We hopefully are operating at ZEEP right now. So uh, this is a, a pressure time product, but it, uh, consider it shorthand for work of breathing or patient effort. So as you're fully ventilated again down to T-piece, uh, even small amounts, five centimeters of, of uh, uh, PEEP, uh, can actually decrease your work of breathing about 40%.
So when you're looking at this, these were patients who uh, had heart failure and were difficult weans. <clears throat> uh, as you go from fully ventilated to T-piece, there's a big change in your, your pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. <clears throat> so uh, we often forget about it, but should stop and take think of the patient who's volume overloaded. How do you diagnose it? So again, there's the, the clinical idea. So we're in the Heart Institute. If you're failing to wean, the very first thing we should be thinking of is, is weaning, weaning failure of, uh, that's based on a cardiac origin. Uh, other aspects of that, the patient becomes hypertensive. Yes, there really doesn't seem to be any good correlation between how quickly you fail on a breathing test, like you, you, you remove onto a T-piece and you fail within three minutes, isn't necessarily uh, a, a Related to this. Radiographically, well, there's challenges there. Not everything that we see on a portable chest x-ray is pulmonary edema. We see a lot of atelectasis, and uh, there's really a lot of unknowns there. Uh, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is the gold standard, of course. In CCUs, there's good reasons why we don't use a lot of pulmonary artery occlusion pressures. And uh, again, there's other challenges. This is one of the first uh, uh, actual publications on the phenomena. And this is a, a gentleman who started off a baseline, had a breathing trial within five minutes. He's working very hard, as measured by esophageal pressures. As he weakens at nine minutes, uh, in fact, he fatigues and can't generate that pressure, but his wedge goes up to about 50. When they're breathing that hard, it's actually difficult to know what is end expiration and get an accurate measurement of wedge. So there's challenges there. People certainly are interested in echocardiography looking at your EA ratio and your mitral annular velocity versus uh, uh, pulmonary artery catheter. Again, this is actually, uh, in, in practice, difficult to do when somebody's huffing and puffing and sweating and diaphoretic to actually uh, do echocardiography. There's more recent interest in biomarkers, so uh, again, BNP versus pulmonary artery catheters, recently published this year. At the same time, they also looked at a technology that we actually have available in the Heart Institute and that you might not be aware of is simply a fancy art line with a very sensitive thermosistor and we do thermal dilution instead of from the right atrium out into the pulmonary artery uh, from uh, a central injection and we measure it in a, a femoral artery. And based on uh, as the fluid goes across the lungs and how it transfers uh, heat, um, based on uh, empiric models, uh, we can say something about the extravascular lung water. That's a, another topic altogether. But we have this technology here, and again, it can be used to, to, to look for uh, increases in extravascular lung water as you're trying a breathing trial to actually diagnose this. There is some interest uh, in critical care medicine about uh, prophylactically using non-invasive ventilation as a weaning strategy. It's attractive, again, because the idea is that without the airway apparatus, and uh, all that that entails, you can decrease your ventilator-associated pneumonias and improve outcomes. The cost is that it can be difficult to feed patients, that you dry up their secretions, etc. So uh, Karen Burns and Maureen Mead from St. Mike's uh, looked at this and recently published in the CMAJ a uh, meta-analysis on this very question. And this is the effect of non-invasive ventilation on weaning failure, but the, the same type of plot would also hold true for mortality because they go hand in hand. As I showed. Basically, when you look at the subgroup of COPD, this actually might be a reasonable strategy. But for other populations, including ours, it doesn't seem to be of any benefit. Now, uh, that's kind of weaning, weaning tests, et cetera, et cetera. The real story in critical care medicine right now is that all these things uh, are dependent on actually waking the patient up and getting the movement. So what's hot really in critical care medicine is, is a holistic approach represented by this bundle here, A, B, C, D, E. So we want patients who are awake and breathing. You've seen that trial in the New England Journal of Medicine by, by, by John Cress. Uh, really re-examining our sedation, uh, looking for delirium, and most importantly, uh, uh, getting patients up and moving. This requires a cultural change. And these things are, these bundles are associated with getting patients off ventilation, better long-term outcomes, especially with regards to functional 
status and survival. And really, as a relatively new specialty, our, our, our vision has moved from the short-term in-hospital uh, issues to the long-term effects of, of this morbidity. These things require a, a cultural change. So right now in critical care medicine, our paradigm is, is, is don't just do something, stand there. Uh, a lot of this seems to be iatrogenic. In summary, uh, so what I've, how I would summarize this is that about half of our time on the ventilator is actually spent weaning. And that extubation delay and failure are both consequential. Uh, the sweet spot seems to be around 15%. Perhaps we can improve. Uh, for the individual patient, obviously, we would, would, would like to. The weaning parameters, however, only are looking at elements of respiratory load versus capacity, and they don't account for airway protection, and, and hence they can have poor prediction. Uh, protocols shorten weaning, but they don't prevent the failure. It might be a good strategy to do these breathing trials in high-risk patients or patients who have volume overload and heart failure uh, without PEEP in order to decrease false positives. Uh, that might come at the uh, price to be paid for the consequences of extubation uh, uh, delay. Uh, I think we need to stop and, and reassess patients who have a breathing trial but high, have lots of secretions, lots of delirium or fluid overload. Certainly the cornerstone of cardiac, uh, weaning failure of cardiac origin is actually fluid removal and that's why we're constantly asking for that. Nitrates are of a special benefit as well. as uh, Planned extubation, non-invasive ventilation in our types of population are, are unlikely to be of benefit and I think what's uh, really needed, um, if I looked at uh, ICUs and in this hospital and any hospital really is, is a cultural change. We need to take a holistic approach to uh, appropriate sed sedation, whether that's no sedation or lightly targeted sedation or daily uh, wake-up trials. These are what people are examining now and especially early mobilization, which I haven't really touched on these things. That's another talk altogether. Anyway, uh, we're done with that. I'll take questions now.